Hey guys, Ron Sliders here with a new episode of Player's Perspective, the interview series where I talk to fellow YouTubers and get to know them a little better. My guest today is a therapist who deals with a wide range of mental health issues by offering encouragement and support. She has made it her mission in life to share her knowledge in order to promote the message of healthy mind, healthy body. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katie Morton. Katie, welcome to the show. Hi, Patrick. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you are a marriage and family therapist intern as well as a mental health vlogger and you deal with many types of mental health issues like depression, bipolar disorder, eating and eating disorders in particular and you graduated with a bachelor's and master's degree in psychology from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. So that seems like a very uh, specific goal and quite the journey you've had. So you're originally from Washington State. So how does this all happen? Wow, you've done your research. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, from a young age, I actually always knew that I wanted to be a psychologist is actually what I thought. And when I started school, I thought, hey, I want to be a psychiatrist. Like I want to be a, a medical doctor. And then when I was in school, I decided I like more the clinical portion of things, which is more just talking with clients, getting to know them. I really enjoyed that process. And so when I was an undergrad, um, I, I really love Pepperdine. If anybody's ever been there, it's gorgeous. And I was, you know, I loved it. So I didn't want to leave. And um, so I went there for four years. And then um, I took a year off to study and apply for graduate school and went to graduate school. And I didn't even know that I wanted to specialize in eating disorders, which is how, like, what my current practice really is. Um, but when I was looking for internships, I found only one that was paid. And since I, I paid for all my own schooling and put myself through school, so I was like, yes, I get paid. This is amazing. And um, I, so I was looking, and it was eating disorder clinic, and that was the only one that paid. So that's where I ended up, and that's where a lot of my training was um, through. And then I'm here today. And the reason I actually started making YouTube videos was because my um, – husband is actually in film production and he was like Katie you, YouTube is where it's at you should start sharing what you know because nobody really knows that stuff and I'm sure people there might be people out there you know and at the beginning if you look back at my like beginning videos I'm really awkward I'm like hello <laughs> so it was it's been really it's been really cool it's been really fun I've been doing it for about two years now yeah I, 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 don't, I don't know of any other therapists on YouTube so you yeah. started a whole new trend yeah, and I haven't seen any either other than like older videos, I guess, from people just put up one or something like that. Yeah. So after graduation, you went to work at an outpa outpatient's eating disorder treatment center and mm -hmm. uh, later at a hospital. And you got to see how uh, such disorders impacted uh, people's lives. And so what type of therapy would, would you uh, be in charge of? At the outpatient clinic? Um, mm, yes. I ran a couple different groups. The way that it worked at the clinic I was at, every clinic's different, by the way. And in the UK, I know that you guys have a totally different setup than in the States. Um, but I would have, I'd be responsible for about three clients. And I see those three clients twice a week for regular sessions. Like, let's say your client, Patrick, you'd come in, you'd be at the clinic, and I'd come get you like a time for appointment, and I'd see you for an hour. And then I'd see you again that later that week. Um, I also ran. A food and feelings group, which if anybody is watching is recovering from an eating disorder, they hate that group. It's like their least favorite group because it means we eat dinner and then we talk about how we felt about it. Like, I feel really fat. I feel really stuffed. I'm not comfortable. I didn't like that. Whatever. And then I also ran um, a body and soul group where I talked a lot about body image and kind of connecting with who you are and what you're about and how really that doesn't have much to do with how you look on the outside. So... Yeah, that was what I was responsible for the most part. I also did meditation groups sometimes and um, shop and cook where I took them out to the grocery store to pick up and buy food and we'd come back and make it. So, And as you're w working with uh, these people in the program, um, I guess you see um, a, a gradual tra a change in how they started from at the beginning to how they sort of... Uh, T towards the towards the end of the program. So, what's it like to see someone sort of change who may be um, who may be sort of really uh, confidence wise? Maybe they they hit rock bottom. And what's it like to try and build them back up, if that's the right term? Yeah. No. So, I mean, I, I know what you mean. What, yeah. Um. To be honest, it, it 
every patient is so different, but I've had some patients who are particularly hard cases, I guess you'd say, where they've been in treatment a lot. Like uh, there's a few girls that really I remember vividly because they'd been in treatment like 15, 16 times. Um, and they're the most rewarding for the pure and simple fact that you kind of see them when they're at rock bottom. Like uh, one of the girls that I saw actually had nerve damage from malnutrition and she um, she had trouble walking. We had to keep her in a wheelchair and all sorts of stuff and um, to watch her body not only heal itself and her be able to get back to doing what she loved, like dancing and stuff, um, has been really cool. And I actually have kept in touch with some of my clients via email and they, mm -hmm. um, they'll they just keep me posted on their life. Like one of mine just had a, a for her first child and it's kind of cool to see them being and getting to enjoy everything that you want them to enjoy, that a, a quote unquote normal person gets to enjoy. Um, so I, I think that's why it's so rewarding. I really enjoy it because of that. So would you say that's uh, been a, had an, a very positive impact on your life? It definitely has. I think that's what's kept me doing it all these years, um, especially even doing my YouTube videos because the cool thing about doing YouTube is you get to reach people for and more people than I could do in just my own private practice or working at a clinic. Um, and it just gives me a purpose, I guess. Yeah, and I think it's uh, really, um, I think seeing if you can sort of reach out to someone in that way, and, and uh, I think it really um, it, it it affects you just in the same way it affects them. I think, and uh, you sort of like you both get benefits from that. I think I agree. It's almost like you get as much out of it as you've given, if not mm -hmm. more. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel that way. Would you say that there is um, a link between uh, mental illness and identity, in the sense that if someone's been living with a particularly severe condition for a long for a long time, many years? Uh, and they begin to identify with that, um, and to the point where that's where the condition, and it's hard to see where the, where the condition starts and and the person ends. Um, I, I, would you say there is a um, strong sense of of, of of identity between a person and and the condition they have? There definitely is. Um, a part of what I talk about in my videos a lot is like. I'll, I'll say to the, my followers and my viewers, like, talk back to that negative voice because a lot of a lot of my clients I find, and I call the negative voice, whether it's your anxiety or it's your depression, your eating disorder or whatever, it kind of takes over our life and we, like, accept it as part of ourselves. Um, and a lot, a lot of us take our identity into that. Like, who am I or what am I? Well, I'm a person who struggles with this. No, 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 you're not that person. You know, you're a person who loves to snowboard or you like to go on walks or you love animals or, you know, and I try to get people to see the two separate portions of themselves and kind of that talking back to that voice can help divide like what it is that is the real you and what part of you is wrapped up in the disorder or the disease. Um, because I feel like that's what keeps people sick for a long time. I suppose the first step you have to take is, um, getting, the person to 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 recognize that there is something wrong because they 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 it may they may have lived with, with such a long time that they may not see that there's a problem exactly. which may be very very apparent to someone else mm -hmm. and so and so of course you've got the, the old saying that goes that you can't help those who won't help themselves and mm -hmm. you have to imagine you have to get them to recognize uh, help and that can be difficult for 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 many people because I think uh, I think everyone has like, an, an inbuilt sense of pride that you know, they, yeah. they can sort of they can sort of stand up on their own and sort of to to accept help is a sign of weakness yeah which of course it isn't um, so is it tough trying to break through that barrier first of all a lot of times it is I think for a lot of people it, it's just understanding that actually reaching out for help makes you stronger rather than weaker because if anybody's ever done any kind of personal work like where you're really going through something and you come out on the other side you think wow that was really hard but I'm better for it you know I've, I'm better now I think getting them to recognize that um, it makes them stronger to work through it and it's easier to just like stick your head in the sand and not deal once I can get them to get on board with that then then I feel like that's kind of that breakthrough. And at that point, then we can talk about um, 
you know, well, where are you at? Is where you're at now? Is that where you want to be, or you know, where would you like to be? And I think it, after you get into that, then talking about goals, and you can kind of go from there and get them out of that state of this is who I am, this is what I'm about, and all of that. In your line of work, you've encountered like many situations like that. Yes, and all different types, from even the people who actually physically try to fight you. <laughs> Like, get off of me, I, I don't want to go to group, or blah, 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 to people who are just really resistant, and their parents are forcing them to come or something. So, yeah, it's a little tricky. Uh, what, um, in sort of that gradual process from where you start towards the, the um, sort of the result, I guess you would say, um, like, what s- steps would, sort of, do you take in order to, uh, rebuild someone's confidence in order to, um, uh, sort of lead successful lives. What um, steps would you, you could take? It, it depends on the patient a lot, but uh, usually, I the first thing that I do with any client that comes in to see me is just getting them to feel comfortable with me and know that I'm not there to judge them. I'm not there to um, make them do anything. I'm there to kind of help them see things that maybe they weren't able to see. I think that is my main goal. And from there, once they feel like comfortable with me and they feel safe. Um, then I usually will work with them what we call making a treatment plan where, and this is why it's different for every patient. So someone would come in and they have a goal of getting into this college, let's say even something like that, or, um, getting out of treatment. A lot of times when I worked in treatment, that would be a main goal. And so we would work backwards from their goal. So what would have to take place for you to get there? And what are you willing to do? Willing to not do? What would you, you know, um, it's just kind of. It, it works backwards from the, the end goal. And a lot of what I do is I'm a DBT therapist, which um, is dialectical and behavioral therapy. And so a lot of that is just learning to recognize our emotions for what they are and then being able to um, use them in a positive way to get us towards a goal instead of letting our emotions run us over where we're like, ah, I'm a little overwhelmed. I've taken a nap or, oh, I can't deal, you know. Um, so, yeah, does that, I know it's not like step, 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 but that's how it kind of works. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it does, it does. Okay. This is more of a uh, hypothetical question, okay. but I think as a, as, a, as a therapist, I think it holds weight. If our understanding of uh, neuroscience progressed to a level where um, by most uh, disorders um, could be treated, mm-hmm. let's say, and, and um, uh, for uh, lack of a better term, uh, cured completely, would, um, would, would people want to go through that? Go through the, the treatment that like the, neuro- yes, yes. Yeah. If, if there was, if, you know, if there was like, uh, such a, a breakthrough in, med- in, in medical science that could uh, allow conditions like that to, to be treated because there have been, you know, lots, many, um, uh, many sort of um, breakthroughs in, 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 in such, in like in um, curing Alzheimer's, for example. Um, and yeah. and uh, w- it w- uh, w- if, and if most um, sort of disorders could be uh, treated in that way, would you think people would, would want to do that? I think, I mean, Honestly, there's actually kind of an example that I would say um, I've come in contact with because of a, a friend of mine, but there's been an implant now. If you're deaf, you can get an implant in your ear that makes you not deaf anymore. And it depends on the, the patient, the person that you're seeing, because with that example, to use that example, it, I find that like half of the people want it and half of the people don't. And I think it would be the same because some people, like we are talking earlier, the identity component if they're not willing to give that up and they think that by doing that and by curing themselves would make them kind of like weaker or uh, they lose their sense of self. What would I do then? And, you know, if they had that feeling, then they they wouldn't want to do it. But for the people, to be honest, the people that are more likely to reach out for help anyways, they would most definitely want to use it. And so I think all of the, the patients and the clients that I see, whether it's in the hospital or in my private practice, they would definitely want to do that as long as it wasn't too invasive, I would assume. And uh, do you think that would uh, lead to any sort of uh, moral issues, would you say, of, of being treated in that way? Because the human mind is obviously far more complex than healing a physical ailment. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, so to use the the uh, metaphor of uh, waving a magic wand and say you know it's <laughs> disappearing. Yeah. Um, do you think that would um, do you think that would create any moral concerns for like, uh, people for the people involved? I think it most likely would. I mean, it, just for the pure and simple fact that there are people out there who don't believe in modern medicine or think things have gone, been taken too far and. Um, there's always going to be people that are like, you can't mess with what God has created and, you know, getting into the human mind can, I mean, there are people out there that don't believe in therapy and they think we're just like digging around in their psyche and like changing things as if we have that power. But um, I think that there'll always be skeptics and there are always people that are against modern medicine, um, no matter what it is, you know. Um, but I, I'm, I'm one of those people that really per- – I'm for that kind of stuff, and I, you know, I, I love the whole magic wand idea. That's why we love Harry Potter so much, because you can, like, magically <laughs> fix things, and, you know, <laughs> doesn't everybody want that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, through uh, your work and um, your YouTube channel and um, also your, your website as well, you've created a lot of um, – you've, you've created your own community mm-hmm. where people can, can share – their stories, their situations, and they can sort of interact back and forth. Uh, and um, and you're on, you have you're on many different uh, social platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr. Uh, you do regular Q and A's on on, the, on those platforms as well. So, uh, how did you go about first creating that community to begin with? I think um, every community is different. That's the interesting thing about the internet is that people will have a preferred place that they hang out and most of mine actually are on tumblr so that was one of the first ones that i remember taking a look at because i would get online and i would i would see what other people are doing and what what it looks like there and then try to create something that felt i guess real and true to what i'm doing in general which is creating a community for people to communicate and feel safe and feel connected and get support um and so i just took a look at each each different vein of social media and tried to cater it to that vein. Um, And it's been a grassroots movement. I mean, I did, it's not like I, I don't make any money off of it. I don't have any sponsors or anything like that, but um, it's just been, it's been really cool. And it's it's been interesting. Each place is creative in its own ways and um, Tumblr being the most creative of all of them. Um, But yeah, so I've just, just taken a look at what other people are doing and tried to kind of model it after that. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, and as it started to develop, and you started uh, uh, doing your vlogs and such, um, how, how how did that make you feel to to um, for when it started growing, and you could see see um, uh, people were uh, deriving benefits from it? It was really exciting, and to be honest, I keep like a, a word document of testimonials, like happy stories and good things and stuff. Because, I mean, you know, from being on the internet, people can be really mean sometimes, and. Mm. You, you know, we're putting ourselves out there and, you know, love it or hate it, it, it we're doing it and we like doing it. And um, so it's been, to be honest, it's been really touching and I really enjoy it. And it's on, because it's very stressful, it's very busy for me, but it's worth it. Like that reminds me why it's worth it. And so I really enjoyed watching it grow. And then, I, it, you know, you feel like you're doing something good. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm sharing information and people clearly need the information. And yeah, it's been really touching. Now, I definitely think for for all types of communities that um, it's much better to create a positive environment around a topic or an idea because when, whenever you see like a, a mean spirited comment, let's say, um, I, I I always think um, is that like uh, is there nothing better that you're doing yeah. right now that you that you should you know that you're writing something uh, hateful? You know, yeah, to is there something you better you could know. be doing? Yeah. yeah. Totally. And, uh, yeah. I think and some goes. of them are really, I mean, ignorant. It's just ignorant comments. It's like they don't even know what I'm actually talking about, but they're commenting, you know, negatively. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with that anonymity of the internet. As exactly. No, no one really knows who, who you know, who those uh, who yeah. people are, unless, you know, you make the effort yourself to get to know people. Yeah. It's like they wouldn't walk up to us. Yeah, they wouldn't walk up to us face to face and tell us that, but they'll write it in the comment, you know, mm. safer that way. <laughs> <laughs> Why is the this sort of uh, uh, community? What 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 is it that? What why is that outreach important to you? Would you say personally? 
I think, um, I don't know, there's a lot of different reasons. One being the fact that I know, because I actually grew up in a really small town, even though now I live in Los Angeles, um, and I know that you don't always have access to the care that you need because there's just not enough people. And so there aren't as many people doing what I do or being a psychiatrist or good doctors, et cetera. Um, and so that's part of the reason why it's really important to me because I want people to be able to receive help no matter where they live. Um, and also because even in my outpatient practice, when someone comes in, it's usually way later than they should have come in. Um, I mean, for instance, I had a couple, and this is, I'm not even seeing them anymore, so no one will know, but they um, came in years ago, and I remember when they sat down in my office, they'd been married for years, and it was like, I remember thinking to myself, you should have come in four years ago when he started cheating on you, because then it wouldn't have grown to this big thing, and so I feel like people don't get help early enough and I'm hoping that by getting information out there that it's not as scary as you think it is and you know just building a positive outlook that it could help and people get help more quickly. Yeah it's very much about educating people and uh, recognizing uh, signs. Exactly yeah yeah definitely. Because you're on so many of these different uh, um, platforms I there's I definitely get the sense um, when looking at them that there's a different sense of interconnectedness between them all like uh, people who are on the uh, YouTube channels they go to they interact on Facebook and Twitter and so and um, and they go back and forth so does that sort of expand that outreach it does um, especially if they share on any of those veins because they all have their different profiles on each site um, but also I find recently because I've been doing the Q and A's every, you know, I have a different place I'm at every day. They'll like follow me, you know, like, Oh, she's on there today. I'll ask my question on there today. Oh no, she's going there, you know? And so that kind of has created that as well. Um, but yeah, they're very interactive. I have very interactive followers, which is great. Um, it, it's funny cause whenever I run into other YouTubers and they're like, you get so many comments and I'm like, yeah, they, they ask a lot of questions and they're, you know, they're, they're there all the time. And I think it's really cool. <laughs> so Casey, what um what uh future projects do you have in ter- in terms of collaborations and whatnot? Um I have a few collaborations that I'm working on right now. Um I won't tell you who. I always keep them a surprise cuz they don't even know that this is coming out and then when you know, you know, I I'll let them know and then we push it and it's kind of a surprise. Um but I do have a self-harm workbook that I am I've completed portions of it. I still have to shoot some of the video that'll go along with it. Um, and that will come up on my website, katiemorton.com. So that's where, that's like my hub and it's easiest for me to link things. Um, and that's my newest, I guess, product. It's free, obviously, but <laughs> you just go on and click to download it. Um, but I've been working on that for a long time and I've got all, of, finally have all of the text done and some of the videos done and then we just have to put it all together. So yeah, that's my newest thing. I'm going to ask you a question now that I ask everyone who does one of these interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is uh, going down a slightly different topic, but that is mm-hmm. um, if a game developer were to come to you and say, Casey, you can create whatever video game you like, what would it be and why? Ooh. Okay, so I had two favorite video games of all time. And if you even know what these are, I'll be so impressed. So my favorite one ever was Plock. Do you remember Plock? He like threw his appendages. So he threw his arms, those were his weapons, and he threw your legs. And as you got hurt, you'd lose an appendage. I loved that game. And so I would create something like that. That was one of my favorites. But I would also add a component of Balloon Fight, where you have the balloons above you. No, oh, yes. Fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something like that. Those are my favorites as a kid. I used to play those all the time. Obviously, I love Mario Kart and stuff like that. But those trumped the others. So, yeah, be something like that. <laughs> so it'd be a com- combination of the two. Yeah, you'd throw your appendages, but you'd also be able to fly away <laughs> with your balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so, Casey, what do, what do you have to say to all the uh, people that have been following you on your various different uh, social media outlets and or, or, or even um, uh, patients of yours what, what would you have to say to, to them who have uh, found you and who have followed you um, uh, to this day I mean most of all just thank you because they, they without them I'm 
I don't, I'm not me. Like I don't grow as a channel. We don't help more people. And I, I always try to remind them that they're, they're the key component to what I'm doing. It's not just me giving information. It's them showing up, sharing, sharing their experiences. Cause I only have the education portion. I haven't done everything that they've done. And so, um, just thanking them for being a pivotal part of my life and a part of this journey that we're on, I guess. Yeah, they're they're like dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've been talking about it a lot, but where can we find you on the internet, Casey? Um, I'm, I'm everywhere. Um, my website is katiemorton.com, and it's Katie, just K-A-T-I. There's no E. That confuses people, but... Thanks to my mom. That's how my name is spelled. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, just Katie Morton. I'm on Tumblr, same. Everything's the same. Instagram is Katie Morton one because there's oddly a lady in like South Africa whose name is Katie Morton. I found that very bizarre. And she's on Instagram, so now I'm Katie Morton one. Um, I'm also on Facebook and YouTube. My channel. You can search for Katie Morton or even just mental health videos, and you can find me that way. Okay, uh, all those links will be in the description below this video if you'd like to check those out <laughs> thank you patrick <laughs> so katie it's been a real pleasure talking to you today yeah you as well thank you so much for having me